Hello, welcome to the Gospel Truth Ministry. I am your host, Rob Glass. Before we get going, please remember to like, subscribe, and click that notification bell so that you get videos from this ministry as they are dropping. Today's topic is going to be about the prosperity gospel and what the Bible, what scripture has to say about it. So we are going to be diving into the Word of God and we are going to discuss this, not really in depth, but you're going to get the point real quick about the prosperity gospel and where I stand as it pertains to it. So in the prosperity gospel, it is also known as the word of faith gospel. The believer is told to use God, whereas the truth of biblical Christianity is just the opposite. God uses the believer. I wish I could have wrote that line, but I did not. I got to give all the credit in the world to gotquestions.org. Wonderful ministry. Highly encourage you to check them out. So let me say that again. In the prosperity gospel, it is also known as the word of faith or the word of faith movement. The believer is told to use God. The believer is really the puppet master over God. Whereas the truth of biblical Christianity, the true gospel, um, it is really just the opposite. God is the one who is using the believer. Don't believe me? Open your Bible. Start reading. It won't take you too long to find out that God is sovereign and God is the one on the throne and in control of everything. We do not get to use God. In fact, God uses us, mere mortal vessels, to do his will. So, prosperity theology sees the Holy Spirit as a power to be put to use for whatever the believer wills. I'm going to pause there. I guess I'm going to have to pause a whole lot in this video, and I'm going to try to keep it as condensed as possible. There, And I've seen this with my own eyes. The believer is told to see the Holy Spirit as a power to be put to use for whatever that believer wants. The Holy Spirit is treated more like a genie. When you rub the lamp, give me what I want, Lord. Look at what I'm doing, Lord. I believe in you, God. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And well, I've always had a problem with that. Let's keep going. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Doesn't get much simpler than that. And he is a person who enables we the believer to do the will of God. The prosperity gospel, though, closely resembles some of the destructive greed sects that infiltrated the early church. Paul and the other apostles were not accommodating or conciliatory with the false teachers who propagated such heresy. They identified them, that is, Paul and other apostles identified these heretics as dangerous false teachers, and they urged Christians, the early church, to avoid such preaching. So early on, you had the prosperity gospel starting to creep in, start to use God as a genie. Rub the lamp, get your three wishes. Gimme, 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 gimme. You know, and they saw this early on in the early church, and the apostles quickly, quickly addressed the issue and told true believers to avoid such charlatans. To avoid such snakes. Paul warned Timothy. Now here's the examples. Paul warned Timothy about such men in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, and verses 9 through 11. These men of 
corrupt mind supposed godliness was a means of gain and their desire for riches was a trap that brought them into ruin and destruction. The pursuit of wealth is a dangerous path for all Christians and one which God warns about. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, having money is not evil. Money itself is not evil. Money is a tool. We use it to buy, sell, trade. It's our means of a barter, bartering system. It is what it is. So having money itself is not the problem. It is the love of money. That is the root of all kinds of evil. Money, when used improperly, can be used to do many, many destructive things. Money used improperly gets you into trouble. It can cause you to get into gambling debts that you cannot get out of. It can cause you to go into debt of other kinds because it has got its grip on you. It can be used to purchase and feed your other addictions, whether it be through alcohol or whether it be through drugs or any other kind of addiction. May it even be pornography. Money isn't the problem. It's a tool, and God knows it, and God uses it properly, and so should all believers. But when you have a love for money, you Put it first. You create it to be your God. You make it to be your God. It has now become your idol. It is the very thing that makes your being what it is. It, it is your identity. And that's a problem because, one, to put anything above God or in the place of God is already wrong. And you're warned not to do it. You're breaking one of his commandments. But then, usually for people who have a love of money... It just never ends well. So for the, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, to kind of recap, are eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now we're still in 1 Timothy chapter 6. If riches were a reasonable goal for the godly, Jesus would have pursued it. Would he not have? But he did not, preferring instead to have no place to lay his head, according to Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, and teaching his disciples to do the exact same. It should also be remembered that the only disciple concerned with wealth was Judas. Now, if God has allowed you to gain for yourself money, and you're you're saving, you're spending, you're giving to the ministry, and you're, you're helping those that you see in need, especially fellow brothers and sisters, by all means, having money isn't the problem. It's, for a lot of people, having wealth becomes a curse. It becomes a burden. But even more than that, people who tend to have a lot or have no need or, or want for the things of the world in the sense that they have all that they all that they need. They feel financially secure. And in that full sense of security, they tend to stray away from God because they don't feel the push to depend on Him because they have this false sense of security and they are dependent on the money. Paul said covetousness is idolatry, as stated in Ephesians chapter 5 and instructed the Ephesians to avoid anyone who brought a message of immorality or covetousness um, to them. Prosperity teaching and preaching prohibits God from working on his own, meaning that God is not Lord of all because he cannot work until we release him to do so. Faith according to the word of faith doctrine is not submissive trust in God. Faith is a formula then by which we manipulate the spiritual laws that prosperity teachers believe govern the universe. 
as the name Word of Faith implies. This movement teaches that faith is a matter of what we say more than whom we trust or what truths we embrace and affirm in our hearts. So think about that. Faith according to the Word of Faith doctrine is not submissive trust in God. It is nothing but a mere formula by which that believer can manipulate the spiritual laws that prosperity teachers believe govern the universe. A favorite term of the prosperity gospel teachers is positive confession. I've heard this used so many times. Don't say that you're sick because then you'll become sick. Don't, 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 don't say that. Don't say anything negative. Don't say you're broke because then you'll be broke. Again, don't say you're sick because then you'll be sick or you'll get sick. I don't even know what to say to that. So a favorite term of prosperity teachers is positive confession. This refers to the teaching that words themselves have creative power. Let me reassure you that only God has true creative power. I just wanted to get out in front and say that. So what you say... Prosperity teachers claim determines everything that happens to you. So what you say, according to prosperity preachers and teachers, determines absolutely everything that is going to happen to you in your life. Your confessions, especially the favors you demand of God, must all be stated positively without wavering. Then God is required to answer as though man could... <laughs> as though we could really require God to do anything. But by being positive and not wavering, God is then required to answer, if you can just imagine that. Thus, God's ability to bless us supposedly hangs on our faith. But let's see what Scripture has to say about this. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, clearly contradicts this teaching. I wish people in the word of faith, name and claim it, health and wealth, prosperity gospel, positive confession movement would just open their Bible and not just pick out a verse here and there to suit their doctrine or their theological beliefs, but read the context of scripture. I would like to see them just start exegeting the scripture versus eisegeting the scripture. Read the scripture and let the scripture truly transform you. Don't eisegete the scripture by putting your beliefs into it and molding the word of God into whatever you want it to be. So let's get to James chapter 4 verses 13 through 16 because this section of scripture clearly contradicts the word of faith positive confession, health and wealth, prosperity, gospel. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you, or why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? So let me say that again. You who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this city or that city. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to invest. We're going to build our business. We're going to, we're going to do commerce there. We're, going to, we're just going to go and do it. You who say that, today or tomorrow, we will go to that city and we'll do these things. Why? Why do you say these things? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Far from speaking things into existence in the future, we do not even know what tomorrow will bring or even whether we will be alive. So James is right there flying in the face of this health and wealth prosperity gospel preaching, this word of faith movement. You say you're going to do all these things and it's good to have plans. It's good to have plans, as long as they're godly plans. But even then, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. It doesn't matter what you say you're going to do. 
You don't know what tomorrow holds for you. God knows that. That is part of his hidden will for your life. You want to know God's hidden will for your life? Wait until tomorrow. You'll have perfect 2020 hindsight vision. So instead of stressing the importance of wealth, the Bible warns us against pursuing it. Believers, especially leaders in the church, talking to you, 1 Timothy 3, verse 3, are to be free from the love of money. Speaking to you, Hebrews 13, verse 5, the love of money leads to all kinds of evil, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Jesus warned, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his earthly possessions. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. In sharp contrast to the prosperity gospel, I'm talking to you, name it and claim it, people. Prosperity, health and wealth, name it and claim it, word of faith, people. I'm talking to you. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his earthly possessions. So in sharp contrast to the prosperity message, the emphasis of the prosperity message, in sharp contrast to that, on gaining money and possessions in this life, Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy them, and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust will destroy it, and also where thieves are going to break in and steal it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. The irreconcilable Contradictions between prosperity teaching and the true gospel of the Bible of our Lord Jesus Christ is best summed up in the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. You cannot serve God and money. You just can't. So for those of you who hold to the teaching of the health and wealth, name it and claim it, prosperity gospel, I hate to break it to you, but you are holding on to a false gospel. It is a false teaching. It is something you need to let go of because it is 100% absolutely wrong. God is not our genie. We do not rub the lamp and he gives us just whatever we jolly well wish. And I know some of you are saying, well, doesn't he say that he gives us the desires of our hearts? Yes, when the desires of our heart line up with his word, his written word, his revealed will for us. When we read his word, when we study it, when it sinks in to our minds and into our hearts, and we let it start molding and changing us into the very image of Christ, the one in whom the Holy Spirit has come into the believer to point us towards and make us like, then we will get the desires of our hearts because the desire of our heart is going to be to do the will of God and to live out the will of God. And when we are praying the will of God, then God is going to definitely give us that desire. Amen. Until next time. This has been the Gospel Truth Ministry. I am Rob Glass. Please remember, like, subscribe, click that notification bell so that you get these videos as they are dropping.